So I have a warm up for you guys, but we're going to suspend that for right now and see if we have time in the end uh, because I want to fit the last bit of lecture in and I want to fit um, the video in. Um, but what we had looked at is the kind of the process for making a decision. So um, we had looked at, you know, how they'll um, have a cert pool and they will use the rule of four and then they'll eventually get to the point of writing a decision and all the formats that those decisions can take, all right? So you hopefully are comfortable with that and the warm-up may bring it back. What we want to look at now is kind of... Um, in general, what were the factors that went into a decision? When a justice is looking at a case, what are the criteria that they're using to judge the case? And you know, you'd say, okay, the Constitution, but it's not as simple as that, all right? When we're looking at legal factors, yes, they're looking at the Constitution, but they're also considering statutory law. Um, they're considering lessons of history. Um, they're kind of looking at that law, that Constitution in its historic context. And they do have to have a consideration of, if we do this, what is the impact? So yeah, obviously they're considering kind of uh, it from a legal constitutional standpoint, but there's more to it. Um, another thing that binds them that I want you, know, you guys to see very clearly is this concept of stare decisis, which is Latin for let the decision stand. Um, in the last video, Sandra uh, Day O'Connor had talked about that. That, yeah, I've got law, I've got the Constitution, but a, uh, an opinion written by a previous justice is kind of like law. It's binding. Um, they have you know, established a precedent using their legal judgment, and the court is bound to it. So um, it's in kind of unusual circumstances where they will you know, do something radical and overturn a former precedent. You know, Roe v. Wade is now the standard. And for them to kind of all of a sudden not see a right of privacy, that would be fairly extraordinary. So there would have to be something kind of unique to the case. There would have to be something that suggests that this uh, legal concept that we've used is no longer workable. Um, you might see, for example, um, something regarding civil rights. And they're realizing that, okay, society has evolved to the point where we're going to begin to ex extend civil rights to other groups. Um, you know, transgender, gay, um, uh, disabled, so on and so forth. So, you know, if society changes and an earlier kind of idea is no longer workable, they might kind of change things. All right. What else would they use? Well, they do have a legal philosophy. There are kind of, um, uh, you know, teachers approach classrooms with different philosophies about whether it should be teacher-centered or student-centered or do I want to do, uh, you know, document-based kind of, you know, activities or more hands-on types of activities? Justices have a legal philosophy about kind of, you know, what their role is um, and uh, how they should conduct themselves based on kind of how they see that role. So, again, the videos brought it out, and hopefully these are kind of familiar. The first idea is this idea of judicial restraint. And what this suggests is they tread lightly that uh, we are nine justices in the Supreme Court. We have been appointed and confirmed by the Senate. We serve for life. We are not um, subject often to the democratic will, and we ought to be respectful of that. In other words, um, you know, we're a little unusual. Uh, you know, every other branch is checked by the public. We are not necessarily checked by that, so we are going to kind of tread lightly. We're going to act with restraint. Because we don't have a democratic base, um, we need to be respectful of the idea that when the masses make a law, as long as it's not constitutional, it should stand. Do you remember Oliver Wendell Holmes from the uh, former videos? And this was kind of his idea, that uh, there was one point where they talked about the forced sterilization of a woman that was deemed mentally uh, incompetent. And that, you know, it had been a law passed by the, the Democratic uh, majority, that that was a medical option to prevent, uh, you know, the, the infirm, the disabled from having kids and creating uh, potentially another kind of problem for the state. And Wendell Holmes said, so be it. You know, the Democratic will has passed it. Um, who am I to stand in the way of that as long as it's Democratic, right? This is similarly a restrictive approach, but restrictive for a different reason. 
So strict constructionalism, um, also referred to as originalism or textualism, basically tries to uh, take a, uh, an approach of restraint based on what they see as the original meaning of the Constitution. So um, they often act in a conservative manner because what they're trying to do is uphold the original uh, intent of the framers. So again, both are somewhat uh, limited, but this group is limited by the fact that they don't feel they have a democratic base and they're always going to respect democracy. This group is restricted by the text of the Constitution and always trying to stay in line with the framers. The ones that are kind of fast and loose are the judicial activists. And those are essentially uh, judges who see the court as unique. Um, they are not subject to constant political pressure, and therefore they can rule more freely. They're the only group that can. And so who else but the court is going to end uh, the, the practices of segregation and discrimination? Who else can do that, right? So they will go ahead and do that. Um, you know, and, and what you're going to see is periods of judicial activism tend to correspond to periods of crisis. We'll see that in a little bit. All right? So that's legal philosophy. That's different than political philosophy, whether or not you see yourself as a, um, a liberal or conservative or a moderate. And that will play a role. Um, it's also called the attitudinal model. Um, you know, what you'll often see is maybe a, a politically conservative justice will often side on the, you know, favor the side of the government, you know, and, and what would be interesting is, um, let's say in a, uh, a civil liberties case, I should call this a civil liberties case, not a civil rights case, but in a civil liberties case where, you know, you're looking at less government to give more freedom, they might be on the side of the government and say, no, there's a need to restrict speech or press or assembly. But similarly, that conservative justice might try to back the government down if it came to economic regulation, right? So you're going to see a conservative kind of look at the role of government. I want uh, more government here, less government there. That might influence their, their uh, rulings, all right? Again, um, we largely mentioned that they don't get elected. They're appointed and confirmed by the Senate, but public opinion does weigh in. That does kind of play a role, right? Um, the courts um, are dependent on the people for their prestige. They're dependent on the people as one of the implementing populations. So you want some evidence of this. Uh, again, I mentioned that conservative justice Bork, and this was one of the first times that uh, Roe v. Wade was a litmus test for Supreme Court nominees. And because he was conservative, they weren't looking at his judicial qualifications. He was eminently qualified. But because he was conservative and outspoken of, with regards to, you know, limits to the rights of privacy, and uh, he was vocal about uh, opposition to abortion, the public, uh, you know, had a ton of rallies. They they went to Washington D.C. in huge numbers. Uh, in this march, there was three hundred thousand. In a later march, um, you know, as this became kind of the norm, and whenever there was a nominee for the Supreme Court and a, and a feeling of a threat to um, abortion rights. It was like a million mom march that, that, that happened uh, after this one. And I talked about the letters going to the Supreme Court. I don't know who reads them, uh, but there's actually an average of 1,000 letters written to the Supreme Court uh, annually, and it jumped up to 46,000 letters. Um, justices aren't immune to this. This is a quote from Reinquest, and he was talking about justices as long as they're relatively normal, and that's something to be debated, uh, can't escape public opinion. Uh, than any, more, more so than anybody else working in, in uh, a job. If a judge were to hermetically seal, I love that language, that's the, you know, the purest form of kind of sealing yourself from bacteria and outside kind of you know, corrupting influences. If we were to hermetically seal ourselves off, we would accomplish very little. They have to kind of understand the impact of rulings and where the public is because that's the implementing po uh, population. And as I said, you want further evidence of that, look at periods of crisis and look at uh, cores, uh, correlation between that and activist judges. Um, another factor that plays into <coughs> is the kind of unique chemistry. You know, I call it judicial character. But what you're really seeing here is personalities matter. There's nine individuals that serve for life. You're going to love the video because there turns out to be a, um, I want to put it this way, Ryan Quest and uh, Sandra Day O'Connor had known each other prior prior to being in the court together. Um, 
and Justice Berger as well. So they're, they're you know, these people kind of travel in similar circles. I want, you, I want you guys to think about how you felt as 10 people locked in a room for a year together and constantly having to kind of pair up with each other. <laughs> you know, that was for a year. That's an academic year. These people are locked in there for life. And so whether or not they get along matters. And you can kind of see that they form small <coughs> little voting blocks. Do you remember like Justice Black had his buddy uh, Brennan? And they kind of you know, hung out together and they ruled similarly. And when Warren, the, the liberal chief justice, kind of came in, uh, Justice Black took him under his kind of, you know, wing until he was ready to run the court. How does a justice get appointed to the chief? So that's, it. that's an interesting thing, because when we look at Reagan, um, what you're going to see is um, he had some vacancies. And um, Ryan Quest becomes his chief justice. Ryan Quest was already an associate justice. So one of the mechanisms is you can take someone from the court and essentially give them a promotion, but there's still an appointment and confirmation process. Alternatively, you know, when you looked at Eisenhower, for example, he went uh, to that guy that he owed a favor to, Warren, who was a governor, and appointed him to become Supreme Court Justice. So you can go directly to go, um, or you may, you know, have to go around the board once. Um, it depends on the president. I don't know if that analogy works. So... Um, at any rate, the, 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 it's interesting to look at these little cliques that exist uh, within the Supreme Court and understand that that's how it influences decisions. Um, we talked about also in terms of uh, you know personality um, and judicial character, you know their background. Remember, I talked about black men who had uh, been a attorney for the Mayo Clinic and had worked with doctors. He had two daughters. That really did influence his ruling uh, with respect to uh, Roe v. Wade. Right. So, again, you get a question about what factors influence, um, you know, how a justice will vote. You can see there's quite a few. You have to go beyond just well, the Constitution. Um, there's their legal philosophy. There's their political philosophy. There's the role that personalities play. Um, there's a number of things that you would work in along with the terminology. Now, the fa final little chunk is to talk about, OK, they've made the decision. Um, but you've seen with Brown v. Board, it's not just, okay, I've made the decision and now, uh, you know, a, a, a political right will immediately vest that, you know, your uh, constitutional liberty is guaranteed and you should have it immediately. Well, you know, court decisions don't always, um, it should be the most expeditious way to get a right. It should be the most expeditious way to kind of change policy or law. Uh, but it's dependent on some things. So... Uh, one, you got to look at the language. How well did they craft it? Uh, in Brown v. Board, again, what killed it? With? Leo? With all deliberate speed. With all deliberate speed. You put the wrong phrase in there, you could kill your, um, your ruling. Two, you need to make sure that you've got support of the implementing groups, starting with the president. Um, you know, Brown v. Board wouldn't, you know, there was questions as to how much Eisenhower would get behind this. But Eisenhower did send, um, you know, the National Guard to Little Rock to make sure that the, you know, uh, students that were being allowed access to that school were allowed in. They had to do so under the protection of the National Guard. Conversely, look at, you know, um, uh, Jackson's, you know, response when we look at Cherokee versus Georgia. Um, and that quote that's, a, that's, you know, given to him, Marshall has made his decision, I'll let him enforce it. Um, and you often see presidents kind of going over the head of the Supreme Court to try to bring pressure. Um, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt railed against the court and again threatened to do the court packing scheme. More recently, uh, President Obama was highly upset over the, the, the ruling in speech now. Again, they kind of, you know, basically dissolved any, any uh, campaign finance reform that's left. Um, and that will bring pressure on them. Congress can do the same thing. Congress can kind of go over their heads, call them activist judges, uh, threaten to break up their districts, uh, you know, the, the you know for the circuit courts. And um, there's ways to kind of you know that these groups, you know, can directly help implement or not, but they can also bring public pressure, right? Um, you know, a tactic that Congress can do too is okay if this was about statutory construction, um, we'll just make a new law. Right? Um, you know, amendments aren't always possible. If, it, if it's statutory construction, we can make a new law. Um, or use our constitutional powers to attack the courts. Now, again, uh, that's just two of the implementing populations. You've got to think about state and local governments as well. 
uh, and you often see them kind of ignoring. Something isn't unconstitutional unless someone brings a case up. So, for example, we've started to define where the, the freedom of religion and self-expression ends um, and where, uh, you know, people's right to not have government established picks up. You know, you've got to make sure that there's not excessive entanglement. You've got to make sure that there's a secular purpose. Um, you've got to make sure that it either advances or inhibits religion. Well, with all of that rule, there's still all kinds of um, high schools that do prayers in school, uh, that do prayers during graduation ceremonies. Heck, the, the Congress itself kicks off with a prayer, right? Why does this happen? Well, again, because states do it, and someone doesn't bring a suit, so it's allowed. Uh, look at all the, the limits on, um, on abortion as well. And again, you've got pretty clear rules um, with some wiggle room in Roe v. Wade, and yet states kind of enforce it or um, take advantage of that wiggle room by different degrees. And lastly, there's you guys, uh, the consumer population. So, um, you know, if states are taking a different approach, it's largely because their population um, isn't completely on board. All right? So... Again, you can kind of see a sequence of like how was the decision made and what would guarantee its effectiveness. That might be a, a potential essay type question. All right? Questions? All right, we say goodbye to Kelly. <laughs>